The best James Bond watch is digital. Now sure, if I asked any Bond fan to name the best Bond watch, the Omega Seamaster or Rolex Submariner are the ones that get all the glory. And certainly, many people think a digital watch for James Bond is blasphemy. But for me, I say the best is the Seiko G757, as seen in 1983's Roger Moore era Bond Octopussy. Let me tell you why. One of the many things I always looked forward to when a new Bond movie is released is the cool watches and gadgets. For example, in the first Daniel Craig Bond movie, Casino Royale, you won't see him using an iPhone. He's got a Sony Ericsson K800i. That makes sense, because Casino Royale was released in 2006, and the iPhone came out in 2007. The point I'm getting at is, a Bond film is essentially a snapshot in time of the technology of that time period. Whether or not the tech is actually real, most of the gadgetry seen in those films are indicative of the era, and the watches worn by all the Bonds are no exception. Certainly, a good quality watch is, um, <clears throat> timeless, <clears throat> And of course, the character of James Bond has impeccable taste, especially when it comes to timepieces. Not surprisingly, a Rolex has been featured in eight films, kicking off the franchise in 1963's Dr. No. But the dominance of the Omega Seamaster is the prominent king, and since 1995, Bond has worn a Seamaster in every film. No matter what the film, though, I feel each watch is a classic in its own right. But I want to talk about the Seiko era. Believe it or not, Seiko had a pretty good run with the 007 franchise in the late 70s and 80s. And it's no surprise because, as I mentioned earlier, the tech used in those movies typically indicates the trends at the time. As early as 1973, a Pulsar P2-2900, the world's first mass-produced LED watch, was featured in Live and Let Die, which essentially launched the digital watch trend around the world. Although technically advanced for the time, the costly LED technology was eventually replaced by cost-effective LCD, and digital watches began their rise as an everyday wrist accessory. And so, from 1977 to 1985, Seiko watches were used by Roger Moore's James Bond in five films, including 1977's The Spy Who Loved Me, which featured a Seiko 0674 LC, which could print out tiny little messages. 1979's Moonraker, that featured a Seiko M354 memory bank calendar. 1981's For Your Eyes Only, that featured two Seikos, a Seiko 7549-7009 and a Seiko H357 Duo display. 1985's A View to a Kill featured three Seiko watches, a Seiko 6923-8080, a Seiko SPR007, 7828-7020, and another analog digital Seiko, the H558-500 SPW001. Now, the watches themselves were real. Interestingly enough, most of the futuristic tech features, like GPS tracking, a little TV, messaging, or cameras, are readily available in modern devices, and we don't think anything of it. But at the time, those special features were strictly film fantasy, though now in hindsight, it did provide us with a glimpse into the future. But the one that I really want to focus on is 1983's provocatively titled Octopussy. It actually features two Seikos, a Seiko TV watch, which is cool in its own right, regardless of this culturally outdated scene, but the one that steals the show is the Sports 100, and that's what this video is really about. The fantasy tech in this movie gives the Seiko G757 Sports 100 a tracking device to locate a Fabergé egg. Q explains how Bond's watch can track the bug and the Fabergé egg because the homing device is compatible with the standard issue radio directional finder in your watch. Okay, sounds reasonable. But fantasy tech aside, let's talk about the actual watch. The Seiko featured in Octopussy was in fact the Sports 100 model number G757-5020, which is often mistaken for the similarly styled Silver Wave, but more on that in a moment. Even though I'm sure there was plenty of paid promotion between Seiko and the film studio, the G757 itself was not made specifically for the movie. In fact, it was just a regular production watch among a family of G757s in similar styles. What's more interesting is that the watch isn't even prominently displayed in any Seiko product catalogs. Apparently, it was just another watch within a family of digital watches that appeared amongst all the other digital watches in the catalog. And there they are unassumingly tucked away in the back of the 1981 Seiko catalog, 
you'll find the first appearance of the G757 family. Making another appearance in their 1982 catalog, Seiko expanded the style selections, again, all the way in the back with the other digitals. In 1983, surprisingly, there are no G757s in the catalog or subsequent catalogs. That means despite the movie's release in 1983, the G757 series was only offered in 1981 and 82. After some research, I found out that the watches were manufactured in 1980 and 81, sold in 81 and 82, and out of production by 1983. So in fact, the Sports 100 was already out of production by the time the movie was released. As I mentioned before, there is some confusion over to which is the actual James Bond watch and which is not. So to be clear, the Sports 100 is the James Bond watch, and the Silver Wave is not. So despite the words Sports 100 and Silver Wave being the most obvious difference here, uh, you will notice also the circle-y part on the Sports 100 does not have any numbers, uh, and on the Silver Wave it does. And you'll also notice that the time, timer, alarm, dual time, and stopwatch selection on the Sports 100 is digital, and on the Silver Wave it's basically a reverse knockout that's printed on the glass. So those are some subtle differences, but they are important distinctions, especially when many eBayers will call everything a James Bond watch, but in fact, there is only one, and it is that Sports 100. One more thing I want to mention while I have this screen up is that I've read, but I cannot confirm, that the Sports 100 versions were more for the North American and European market, while the Silver Wave was more for the Japanese market. Again, I don't know if that's true, but that is what I read, so maybe that's why they're slightly different. Now here's where this takes a personal turn for me. In 1985, my dad actually owned the G757-4010 version of this watch. Now this may be hard to see, but that is actually my dad, and he is actually wearing this watch. It was the coolest thing, and when I was a kid, I begged him for one for my birthday or Christmas. And when I was 12 years old, for Christmas, I actually got one as a gift. Mine was the slightly different version, the G757-4000. While this is not a typical watch a kid would wear, I certainly liked it and got a lot of cool points for it. This is a little hard to see, but I'm wearing it here. But I can do even better than that. Here I am in 1989 playing with bottle rockets and wearing that watch. And there you can kind of see it on my wrist. And I'm going to turn this slowly and slow this down and then you'll be able to really see it. And yes, I know I had wonderful hair. Thank you. So let me freeze frame this and you can kind of see it a little bit there. But, believe it or not, I actually still have this watch. Do you want to see it? Here's what it looks like now. Um, okay, so I may have been a little rough on it as a younger guy, but at least I still have it. Now, I do wish this worked, and I know it's supposed to look all beautiful like this, but interestingly enough, I did go onto eBay about 10 years ago and buy the one that my dad had, the 4010 version. So let's talk about the really nice one I have. So part of this might be a good lesson into why not to give a 12-year-old a office watch. But in reality, um, I wore it for five years and I fell off my bike. Um, and that's actually what made the watch uh, crack like this. But that aside, I'm going to focus on the 4010 version. So as you'll be able to see, the similarities between the Sports 100 and this 4010 version, um, other than styling, uh, like the horseshoe bezel and the band and a few other things like that, these are essentially the same watch function-wise. So I'm just going to review my 4010 version so you can see all the same functions that the Sports 100 has. So starting with the top left, this is the light button, and there is actually a light, and believe it or not, the light in this works. Uh, I couldn't really get it that well on camera, and it doesn't illuminate the numbers all that well to be able to see it. But the fact that this 40-year-old watch still has a light that works, um, kudos to you, Seiko. That's pretty good design. Now, this bottom left button is the mode button, and when you press that, that changes between the time, timer, alarm, dual time, and stopwatch options. And I'll show you that in a moment. So here on the right side of the watch, the top button just does the start, stop, and select. Uh, and the bottom one does the lap reset and set. And of course, that depends on what mode you're in uh, to what function these do, but I will show you how these work also. So by pressing the mode button one time, that will put you into timer mode. Then press the set button to select how many minutes you would like it to count down. Now press the start button and the timer begins. 
I was always very impressed with this design, how the inside ring is how many minutes there are on your timer, and the outside ring is the seconds being counting down. I thought this was very clever for its time, and uh, just a really cool feature. I'm going to speed this up so we get to hear the chime at the end. All right, coming up on the last few seconds here. It's certainly not the loudest chime in the world, but if you were wearing it and you were timing something, you would be able to hear it. So by pressing mode again, it now puts you into alarm mode. I realize that my fingers are in the way in a lot of these shots, but I'm zoomed in super close. But I will describe what I'm doing, uh, which is pretty straightforward anyway. But what I'm doing here is... I'm using the set and select buttons to change the hour and minute hands of the analog looking watch that's inside the circle. This is now set to have an alarm at 3.04 a.m. And I can tell because this little a.m. thing right here states that it would go off at 3.04 a.m. Also, the alarm can be toggled on and off itself by selecting this little alarm looking thing, um, which can go on and off. And right next to it, that bell is actually the hourly chime. So that's how the alarm and chime get activated and deactivated. So push mode one more time, and now you're in dual time mode. This is another really cool feature of this watch, because you have an analog hour, minute, and second hand inside the circle part. Another thing worth pointing out is that this AM tells you when the digital digits are in either AM and PM mode. And this little PM mode here lets you know when the dual time is in either AM or PM mode. And I believe that these are an hour different because I'm guessing that one of them is in daylight savings mode and the other one is not, which accounts for the time difference by an hour. Pressing mode one more time now gets you into stopwatch mode, and pressing the top right button actually starts the stopwatch. Now this should look familiar to you because this is actually what was happening when James Bond was tracking the Fabergé egg. He was just turning on the stopwatch. So as you can see, this was a very richly featured watch for early 80s. And for that matter, I would say even today, this would be a pretty richly featured digital watch. Oh, and one more thing. If you press the bottom right button, it does have a lap feature. So it will remember the first lap. And then if you press start and stop again, it will give you the second time for the lap. So again, this thing just has some really super cool features on it. So pressing mode one more time now brings us back to the top, but this time, this is actually where you can set the date and the time. So pressing the top right button will actually toggle between the seconds and the minutes and the hours, and then you can also get into the date. Now this does not have a year uh, to set, so the only time I've ever really remembered having to adjust it would be once every four years during a leap year to adjust for the extra day in February. So as you see it here, this is the default time mode, and overall, I think this is a very beautiful and thoughtfully designed watch, especially for the era. So here are my two watches side by side, and you can see some of the similarities and some of the differences here. But what I really want to do is I'm going to open up the bad one just so you can kind of take a look inside and see what the insides look like. So normally I would do this on a softer surface, but since this one's broken, I'm just going to kind of do it here on the table. Uh, the actual opening is at that top right button. That right there is where you can pry it open. Here I'm using a sharp bent nose tweezers. Uh, if you maybe have a little baby tiny sized screwdriver, but just try to gently open it up if you do have one. I've noticed a lot of scuff marks on this, so I'm sure at some point I was very careless in my opening of this before. As you can see, I don't even know what I have in here, and it's pretty dirty, so let me spin this around and... Uh, change the camera so I can get in a little closer. So it looks like I had that little foam piece there to hold down the battery. Uh, you can see that I must have lost the screw at some point, but uh, let me take the module out so we can flip it around and see it too. It doesn't look like the glass is broken from the inside, so I don't know if it's just kind of shattered on the edges, but Regardless, it's pretty bad. And I'm going to continue to flex on everyone on just how bad of condition this is in. Um, 
Look, I was a teen. I don't know. But I didn't get it. It is what it is. But this is what it looks like. So flipping it around and looking at it from the front, it looks like there's hope to save it. But uh, the back's pretty bad, so let's put a battery in and see what happens. Now one thing I must say is that these watches need constant power. And I mean you cannot let them die for any length of time. So buy a strip of 391s because if you see the watch start to dim or start to flash, you gotta replace them or it typically cannot recover. So with the fresh 391 battery, uh, here's the moment of truth. I'm gonna put it in the back. I have lowered my expectations and let's see what happens. And if I could hold this straight and get this into frame, you'll see that there's just some dead digits. It's flashing. Uh, it's just not okay. So not surprisingly, I'm going to call this unsalvageable and try to use it for a parts watch in case there is something that goes wrong with my good one. Oh, and one more thing I want to mention is the serial number. The first digit is a zero. That means it was manufactured in 1980. And the second digit is a D for December. And I guess the rest of the digits are a sequence number of manufacturing. Even though this watch clearly looks like it's from the 80s, I believe its styling is far more timeless than some initially give it credit for. There are even several modern day watches that pay homage to this classic, like this Casio World Time, which is a cheaper alternative than finding a vintage Seiko on eBay that is still in functioning condition. In fact, Seiko themselves recently released a set of watches in conjunction with the Metal Gear Solid 5 that are direct descendants of the G757 series. As you can see here, it's almost a one-for-one -one updated recreation. Which brings me to my point that, regardless of this being an 80s watch, the Seiko G757-5020 Sports 100 featured in 1983's Octopussy, best showcases that era of technology through a watch better than any other Bond film. And regardless of my own personal affinity to this watch, to me, its classic era-defining styling and modern-day popularity make the G757 digital watch the best James Bond watch. If you like what you saw, please consider liking and subscribing. Thanks for watching.